dead wax, timing strip, OB, unofficial, you seriously might need a translator to understand everything that's going on within the hobby of record collecting. Or you can watch this episode talking about records. My name is G.I. Sanders from NTX Vinyl, a small chain of independent record shops in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. If you're not local, but you are in the U.S., you can shop online. In fact, I've got a curated page of recommendations and albums that I love. You can find that at ntxvinyl.com slash G.I. That's ntxvinyl.com slash G.I. for my recommendations, my picks, albums that I'm listening to right now or looking forward to listening to in the future. Lastly, would love it if you'd subscribe to our channel here on YouTube and follow us across social media, Facebook and Instagram at NTX Vinyl is the handle. Let's talk about terminology. I've done this video before, but it's been a while and I've learned a ton and there's a ton of new terms, I guess you could say, that have come up within this hobby of record collecting as it is continually evolving. So I've got an entire list of what's probably 50 different terms that I'm going to go through starting at the very basics. So first and foremost, let's talk about speeds. There are three speeds of records. Those would be 33 and a third, 45 and 78. That also has to do in most cases with the size of the records. A standard record, which is known as a 33 and a third or a 12 inch LP is what you're looking at here. Um, the speed has to do with the number of revolutions. So it's going around 33 revolutions per minute. If you get into a 45 or a seven inch single, uh, 45 RPM. Now 12 inches can also be pressed at 45 RPM. And then obviously you get into 78s, which are um, shellac records, completely different material than vinyl and uh, usually predate 1960, going back into the you know 20s, 30s and 40s, right? Uh, stereo versus mono. This is a, a very important one. This has to do with the channel. So, right, mono is one, one channel, meaning you're going to hear the exact same thing out of your left and right speakers, your left and right channels. If it's stereo, then you've got stereo effects going on. You can hear one thing in one channel and one thing in the other. Uh, mono came about, uh, everything was mono up until about 1957. And then from 57 to 68, like if you go back to the Beatles era, there's lots of albums that were pressed in mono and in stereo. Pretty much everything post-1968 or 1970 uh, was produced in stereo because if you're a musician, it gives you a lot more creativity when you can uh, mix an album or a track and have different things happening in the left ear versus the right ear, right? Let's talk about... Um, LP, I mentioned uh, LP, that stands for long play, which means it's a traditional, uh, a full album, right? There's also a single. Now that could be a 12 inch single, that could also be a seven inch single. Then there's the EP, which stands for extended play. This can be kind of confusing because an EP is typically, um, you know, less than an LP, so it's not a full album. So why is it called extended? Well, the reason why it's extended is because it's, it's extended off of the single. So a single is typically one or maybe two tracks, depending on uh, you know the, the length of the tracks. You can fit more on a on a single, but an extended play will go in and be three, four, five tracks versus a long play typically is eight, ten tracks or more. Right? Remix and remaster. These are probably two of the most interchanged and confused terms when it comes to record collecting or music in general, regardless of format. So. Let's talk about mixing and mastering. First of all, I'm not going to go into a whole lesson here, but the I, a whole lesson, but the idea or the process of mixing a song or an album or a piece of music is that you're actually manipulating the sounds. You're manipulating the volume of the voice or the guitar, or the drums, the bass, or the cello, or the flute, doesn't matter what it is. Not only the volume of it, but the tone of it, how it's equalized, where it sits in the mix. 
um, as far as maybe you want it just in the right channel and you want it a little lower and then when it flips to the chorus of the song you want it to go to the left channel and you want to increase the volume and lower the bass like that's all mixing you're actually taking what the musician recorded and in some ways you're manipulating it or um, 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 massaging it to get it to where the artist wants it in the mixing phase that's all very intricate and very involved and there are professionals who specialize in just mixing albums right mastering is totally different once the mix is done and complete and the artist and the producer and everybody has signed off on the mix that is then shipped over to a mastering engineer a mastering engineer then puts his expertise on top of it to make sure it's going to sound good on multiple different formats. It's going to sound good on vinyl versus CD versus digital, all those types of things. And mastering gets into the fine details of, uh, of in, in vinyl's case, actually cutting the album and providing it to the plant that it's then going to make the stampers that will produce the album, right? So don't get confused when you see an album that's been remastered and think, oh, I don't want that. I want the original. It can very well, and in most cases, still be the original mix. So it hasn't changed. It's just going to be updated from a mastering standpoint and actually made to sound better to your ears. Not always, but that's the goal. All right, let's get into the physicality of the record and packaging. First one on my list, I'm just going to go down the list in order. I've got a few examples. Hype sticker. What is a hype sticker? Well, there's a hype sticker. It's a sticker that goes on front of the album, typically on the shrink wrap, and it promotes something uh, to help sell the album. Most cases, it'll say featuring the songs, or it'll say limited edition, or it'll say numbered out of this many copies, or it'll say remixed and remastered. Any details that make the album different or unique, that is contained on the hype sticker. It's called a hype sticker because it's supposed to create hype for the album, right? Um, a gatefold. This is a, a gatefold jacket here, which means it opens up folds in the middle. There's also double gate folds, triple gate folds that have multiple fold outs, right? Uh, the inner sleeve, that's very important. Got a, let's see, I've got a copy of Footloose here. So first of all, you've got your clear outer sleeve. This is very important for protection of the jacket, prevents ring wear, prevents shelf wear, all those types of things. Um, this is in shrink wrap here. Shrink wrap is obviously what it comes in out of the factory. So it's factory sealed. Then you have your inner sleeve here now this is happens to be a printed inner sleeve so this actually has lyrics um, credits those types of things and then you've got the record inside from there um talked about the insert the jacket this is uh you know this is also known as the jacket or the cover you've got the spine here on this side the spine is typically where the art uh, label the artist name and the album name and catalog number in this case uh, i've got a catalog i've got columbia on this and i've got the catalog number js 39242 that's essentially an identifier for the label you can imagine if you're pressing hundreds of different albums you've got to have a way to identify them by number not just by um, artist name um, and album name let's look at the actual disc itself so you've got the uh the wax you've got the grooves uh anything uh anywhere you see grooves that's the music you have the disc label in the middle now Closest to the disc label, there is an area. On some albums, it's small. Some albums, it's larger. It depends on the amount of music that's on a record. The amount of grooves pertains to the amount of music. And the inner wax, or the dead wax as it's called, has no music on it. It's completely smooth. And that's where you're going to find even more details about this album. So if you put it in the right light, you put an album in the right light, you can usually find etchings or matrix numbers that are stamped or hand etched into the vinyl and that's again um, an identifier in regards to the specific pressing of the album that's very important um, in most cases if you um, can can see the identifiers those matrix numbers matrix numbers or the etchings and put those into an app like discogs that will get you closest to finding the exact version of an album that you have um, Let's see, I think, I've, I think I hit on all the stuff about details. Okay, so let's talk about weight. Um, most records are pressed somewhere between 140 grams and 180 grams. If you literally put this record on a scale, I can tell you this is at 140 gram 
it can go as low as 120 gram and those get pretty flimsy. 180 gram is kind of the standard in modern times. Uh, that has nothing to do with sound. That has to do with the weight of the record and the thickness of the record. And mostly just has to do with durability, right? So that's uh, different weights. I hesitate to even mention the term audiophile, but an audiophile is typically a person um, that puts a puts a uh, a lot of importance on the sound of a record. I will say that if you're an audiophile, then you really appreciate sound and you look for records that have superior sound versus more common pressings. Right? Um, original pressings. So original pressing is kind of a vague term because original doesn't necessarily mean first pressing. So a first pressing would be um, the uh, an album that was part of the first batch press. So typically vinyl is a small batch thing. It may be pressed in a couple thousand at its largest before then it needs to be repressed, right? So a first pressing, if you can identify one, a lot of times there's no way to identify a first pressing versus just an original pressing, um, is typically more sought after because the first pressings that come off, um, off of the uh, you know conveyor belt at the plant, those are seen as a little more, um, not necessarily valuable monetarily, but valuable because maybe they have a little more pristine sound because the stampers that made them when records are pressed wear out over time. They are mechanical parts, they are manufactured. And so most times a stamper uh, can only be used you know, a couple thousand times at most before you need to get a new one. So if you get a record that is pressed very early, like the first in the first run or the first pressing, then maybe it has a little better sound and certainly could be a little more collectible because it's one of the early versions. No different than if you're collecting, you know, baseball cards or something. You want lower numbers. You want um, want something that's as closest to the original or the first as possible, right? Um, OG is a term that has come to essentially mean original pressing. That stands for original gangster. I don't know how it got into the vinyl collecting hobby, but if you see someone that says this is an OG pressing, that essentially means it's an original pressing, right? Or a vintage pressing or an early pressing. Uh, two other terms. I talk about remixed and remastered. The other terms that are interchanged and confused a lot have to do with reissue and repress. So a repress of an album is essentially, hey, an album has come out, it came out in 1970, and it got repressed several times throughout that year. Now, it wasn't reissued. It's the exact same album. The demand was simply high enough that the press, the label and the pressing plant had to press it several times. So there could have been multiple represses throughout the first year or many years as that album came out. Now, a reissue is something different. A reissue is when they go back and they say, hey, contractually, we pressed the 5,000 albums that were agreed upon. We need to cut a new contract with the label and the pressing plant and the artist, and we need to do a reissue. Now, sometimes not anything changes on the reissue from the original pressing. A lot of times it does, but um, these can be identified in Discogs where you will see, or if you go research, uh, you know, in a book or on eBay, if you'd like, and you can find um, pressings that are treated as represses versus reissues. So again, it's a very fine line there, but it is, it's a very important line as well. Um, in addition to represses there uh, and, and reissues, there are test pressings. So a test pressing, as you can imagine, is something that predates even the first pressing. And that's why they are even more collectible. They are typically in very small numbers. If you can get a test pressing of an album, it might be one of 10 or one of five test pressings. Those test pressings are listened to by the mastering engineer, the artists themselves, the label, anybody involved that's going to approve that test pressing to then be manufactured in more uh, bulk quantity, right? So test pressings can be very, uh, very valuable and rare and collectible because of that fact, because there are very few of them. Um, a lot of test pressings, I'm sorry, let's talk about promotional copies next. Promotional copies, so you've got your test pressings, very few of those. Next in line as far as rarity or maybe collectability would be promotional copies. Promotional copies back in the day were sent to DJs because they wanted to get the album in the DJ's hands on the radio as soon as possible to start promoting the album. So they would send promotional copies to the DJ. A lot of times those 
those copies had a different label. So instead of this disc label being a color or having um, art or anything on it, it would be a white label. So that's known as a white label test pressings. And a lot of times those are the most sought after. There's also, um, sorry, promotional pressings. Um, there's also uh, different stamps. So on, on the backs of album covers, you will see uh, in a lot of cases, you would see like a stamp here, or sometimes it's on the cover. It's usually gold and those are called gold stamp promos. A lot of times those aren't as rare or collectible. It's just the normal album that they just stamped on it before they sent it to the DJ, before they sent it to um, a lot of times journalists if they wanted to get a review. Again, promotional copies to promote the album, not only before it comes out, but also as it is out to get people talking about it, writing about it, and playing that uh, playing that music. Sometimes you'll see a, a DJ stamp on certain albums as well. It'll say DJ copy or promo copy, and then it'll have uh, just the, the letters DJ to signify that it was actually for the disc jockey to play that album on the air. Um, timing strip, speaking of promo copies, a lot of, especially DJ copies, this is, uh, so you can see here, this is a demonstration not for sale. There's that gold stamp that I just talked about, and it says for promotion only, ownership reserved by MCA Records, sale is unlawful, right? So the idea is that the DJ was supposed to get this, and he's not allowed to sell it, he's only allowed to play it on the air for promotional purposes. Now this is the timing strip here, and this is important because a DJ would look at this, and a lot of times, no, this would inform him exactly how long the songs are. So he would know if I've only got four minutes left before a commercial break, well, I can fit this song in. A lot of times they'll, uh, these will be marked up um, and identify the key tracks or the singles that the DJ should play. So these are always fun. Timing strips are fun to see on the front of promotional copies, especially if they have notes uh, scribbled on them. Import, another very broad term, but essentially I, I'm in the United States so if anything is pressed outside of the United States and brought in and sold, that is an imported copy, no different than any other good, right? Um, so imports can A, typically be more expensive because you have extra costs. They have to be brought in, shipping costs brought into the country and then resold. Uh, they can also be a little bit more rare. So if I'm in the US, uh, obviously finding a record from you know, Holland or Japan, an imported copy in the US is harder because there's just not as many of them around because they weren't made in this country, right? So import um, is a pretty vague term, but essentially it just means anything that's imported into the country you reside in. Um, bootleg and unofficial. So bootleg. Um, bootleg is a term that essentially originated back from when people used to go to concerts with a tape recorder and they would audio, they would record the audio without anyone knowing, without any permission. And then they would take that audio and they would reproduce it in some form, whether it was cassette or record, or, you know, obviously a CD and they would sell that. Now, depending on the country, country you're in, recordings of live bootlegs are, um, in some ways frowned upon, in some, pay, in some ways completely illegal. It kind of depends. But again, that originates from the idea of, of someone going in and taping a live show. In most instances, there's also bootlegs exist of recordings that were not supposed to be released. Maybe the album leaked. Maybe someone took one of those promotional copies and started mass producing it illegally. So there's lots of different kind of uh, formats of a bootleg. Um, unofficial has is a newer term in the... Uh, in the vinyl hobby, which essentially, it can mean a lot of things too. Unofficial can mean, well, obviously the opposite of official. So if it's not officially pressed, then it's an unofficial pressing. It gets interchanged with bootleg a lot. It also gets entered, there are also counterfeit pressings. So what's the difference between an unofficial and a counterfeit? In a lot of ways, there isn't one. It just depends on the specific scenario. But essentially, bootlegs, unofficial, counterfeits, they are all albums that are not sanctioned and approved by the artists and the label. So they're out there kind of in the gray market, if you will. Pressing plant code. So on a lot of, I talked about the catalog numbers um, on the spine of the record. So again, a lot of times you'll have the catalog number on the spine of a record. You'll also have the catalog number on the disc label. And then as you get into the, the finer details of those matrix numbers of the dead wax etchings that I mentioned, you will find other codes. Pressing plant codes are typically in the dead wax and a lot of times they're also on the uh, appended to the, uh, the catalog number. So if you see PR, that means it was a, uh, the press well 
suppressing plant. If you see MO, that means monarch. If you say AR, that means ally. CTH means Columbia. These are all different pressing plants. And a lot of times that will tell you it, not only uh, the plant it was pressed at, but the city it was pressed in. So again, minute details that a lot of collectors do care about. Some collectors like to collect stuff only from specific pressing plants, believe it or not. Um, there are also additional um, etchings a lot of times, um, more initials that pertain to mastering engineers. So one of the most famous ones is RL, which stands for Robert Ludwig or Bob Ludwig, one of the most famous mastering engineers, um, as well as BG, Bernie Grunman. Those are names of individuals who their profession is mastering audio in uh, most cases for the vinyl format. So you will see those etchings in, on the dead wax. They're very hard to see, but if you find a copy of one of the most famous examples is of Led Zeppelin II, and you find that it has RL etched very small in the dead wax on one or both sides. That means it was a Robert Ludwig mastered version of Led Zeppelin II. And in that case, it's a very sought after pressing because uh, they, that was the first pressing that he uh, mastered and apparently was mastered a little hot. So they had to adjust it for that second pressing. So if you find the first pressing with the RL on it, it's a much more valuable sought after album, right? All right, let's talk about condition. There is a lot going on with condition. First of all, what is the gold mine standard? If you see anyone reference gold mine, that is essentially um, a standard of grading that most people in the record collecting hobby abide by. It starts at poor, goes to good, then to very good, then to very good plus, then to near mint, then to mint. So no different if you're putting a grade on, again, like a baseball card, they kind of grade it out of numbers, like a, a two out of 10, a five out of 10, those types of things. For records, it goes from poor to mint. So if you see a VG or a VG plus, that means very good or very good plus. And there are specific definitions defined by Goldmine in that original literature that they produced. Um, and everyone has kind of fallen in line with that and it's very helpful. So if you go to Discogs, if you go to NASDISC, if you go to any selling platform um, and you're buying a pre-owned record, you should be looking for that gold mine grade of what it is. And then you can actually look up what that means. So you may look it up and see, oh, VG plus, that means it's gonna play very well. It shouldn't have a lot of surface noise. It should look clean visually, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's a lot about grading and gold mines. As far as uh, particular terminology around um, condition, ring wear is a big one. So ring wear, I don't have an example of good ring wear, but essentially if you're looking at a cover and you see an outline of the record, that's ring wear and that is caused by the pressure of records either sitting on top of each other or sliding in and out. And eventually you get to get, you, you have a ring uh, that is the same size as the record because you see that, amount, that indention essentially. Um, there's also uh, seam splits. This one's got a really bad seam split. This is an old record that I just grabbed. So you see how that seam right here is split? That's, uh, that's obviously um, important when you're gauging condition of a cover, if it has any seam splits, if it has any shelf wear. So you can see in addition to the split, this has a bunch of wear. Um, corner wear, that would be another term. You're gonna look for any corner wear there. Um, as far as gratings on the actual vinyl, there's a couple things to look for. Um, something called a feeler. I use this all the time. If 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 you run your fingers over um, a particular blemish on a record and you can feel it like a scratch, essentially, that's called a feeler, and that's typically pretty bad because if you and my, the way I think about it is, if you can feel it, then you're absolutely gonna hear it because if you can feel that uh, with your finger then obviously your stylus is going to be able to feel it and it's probably going to have a tick or a pop or even worse, maybe even get stuck and not be able to get out of that, uh, get out of that groove, right? Hairlines are different. So a hairline is maybe a mark on a record that you can see, but you can't feel it. And then a lot of times you won't be able to hear it either. It depends on the severity of it, of course, but essentially it's a very, very light line that you can't feel that shouldn't impact sound in a drastic way. Um, sleeve scuffing. If you ever see not like a single scratch, but you see a bunch of um, kind of what look like scuffs, that's caused by inner sleeves. And a lot of cases it's caused by an inner sleeve that is made out of paper like this, which is not preferred. The preferred type of inner sleeve, which I'll show you right here, 
on this mad season record is a poly lined inner sleeve. So here is an inner sleeve that you want to adapt to because these will not cause sleeve scuffing because it is a much smoother surface. So when you get an album and it has paper sleeves, if it's an album you really care about, and you're anticipating owning for a long, long time, and you wanna take care of that record, you should probably, or I would recommend, replacing those paper sleeves with uh, poly-lined inner sleeves. That's very important. Um, let's see, moving on. Oh, corner cut right on cue. So you see how this corner is cut right here on this jacket? That is done for, um, that was done back in the day when an album was going to be discounted. So they wanted to make sure that once it got discounted and went into the discount bin that it didn't get shipped either back to the label or didn't get put back at regular price that they would actually cut the corner or in some cases they would have a hole punch machine and actually punch a hole not only through the jacket but also the inner sleeves not the records of course but they would punch through so that is to, to signify um, a discount copy in most cases um, when you're talking about value as it pertains to um, the norm these days, which is on the Discogs app, you will see low, median, and high value. That median value is kind of like the average value of a normal VG to VG plus copy. That's kind of important because if you're glancing at a record at a record store and you think you may want to purchase, you may see if that median value on Discogs aligns with where that price is and the condition of that record. Let's talk about warp. There are typically, there's a lot of different kinds of warp, obviously on a record. But warp is when a record doesn't lay flat anymore. That's a really flat record right there. So that's what you want to see. If it's bold like this, that's typically called dish warp because it looks like a bowl, obviously. It looks like a dish. There's also edge warp around the outside where it's got a little more wavering just around the outside. So there's a bunch of different types of warp, but dish warp and edge warp are a couple of the ones that you see the most. Um, let's see, last on the list as far as condition uh, in that category. A lot of times I'll see a player copy or keeper copy. What does that mean? Well, a player copy is kind of like, well, I'm gonna play this one. It's not perfect, but it's a great player copy. It's cool to own. It may not be in pristine condition. It may not be um, you know, the most valuable copy of a particular record monetarily, but hey, a lot of people have all player copies in their collection and that's totally fine. Beyond that, there's a term called keeper copy. Collectors refer to keeper copies as ones that, hey, this is pristine. It's still in the shrink wrap. It's absolutely clean. Maybe it was even sealed when you got it. Those are keeper copies, ones that are, again, higher end. Doesn't matter if that's higher end monetarily or just condition-wise. That's, that's uh, debatable, obviously. But uh, keeper copies are typically looked at as more sought after than player copies. All right. Now we've got a uh, section that I just put specialty because it has to do with a lot of uh, unique types of records. I believe this Mad Season is a good example of my first one, which is an etching. Yes. So why would anyone do this to a record, right? You can see that this actually has artwork, in this case, the band's name, etched into the record. Well, the reason why they did that is because there was not enough music on this album to fill all four sides of a double LP. So they had an entire extra side. So instead of just leaving that extra side completely blank, they did something cool and they put an etching on the back. A lot of times it will again um, tie to the album artwork, the cover, lyrics, all kinds of stuff. So etchings are uh, only for visual appeal. You cannot play that side of the record. There's no music on it. It is just something cool added in. Limited edition. I talked about limited edition when I talked about the uh, the hype sticker. A lot of times these hype stickers will say limited edition. Well, what does that mean? Unless it's limited edition and it has an actual number on it, you never really know how limited it is. And in a lot of cases, um, labels, um, retailers, they will press things and put limited edition on them and it's not really limited. So in a lot of ways, it's just a marketing term to get people to think it's a, a, a more sought after valuable pressing and they will want to sell them so they'll stick limited edition on it that's different than if it's number because a lot of times pressings will say limited edition and you've got number 64 out of 500 well you know they could always go on and press more but 
hopefully they're sticking to, uh, you know, telling the truth and only pressing 500 copies of it and, and numbering them, you know, that type of thing. So numbered copies and limited edition kind of go together. Um, picture disc, I don't have one on hand, but if it's a picture disc, um, it's not going to be black vinyl. It's actually produced. A, it's a completely different way of producing a record, a picture disc. The entire thing is a visual. They are, uh, they are visually cool, but typically the sound on picture discs are, uh, is not, is far, uh, less quality than a typical vinyl record. Translucent splatters, swirls, marbles. Those are all types of colored vinyl records. So a typical record like this, which is a colored record. Yes, black is a color. All records start out as essentially a natural, almost a little bit of a clear vinyl. Black is added um, uh, to create a black vinyl record. And um, this is an opaque record because you can't see through it. If it's a translucent record, you can hold it up to light and actually see the light through it. There's a lot of tra there's translucent black records. There's translucent of every different color. And then when you see different effects on the record, like different colors splattered out or marbling or colors and colors and things like that, those are all different vinyl color effects. Obi, this is one that is um, typically not understood because it sounds it stands for outer band insert, which is confusing because it's on the outside, but it's called an insert. Typically, these are seen in a couple different places. First and foremost, they're seen in Japan. You see what is known as an obi strip on a lot of Japan press pressings. This is an original um, or an early pressing of Led Zeppelin III, and you can see the outer band insert in this case is all in Japanese. It doesn't have to be in a different language to be an obi though. An easy example of that is right here. This is a company called Vinyl Me Please, which I'll get to, but this is their style of obi strip on the outside. So again, it's kind of like a hype sticker where more information is added on the obi strip. It's a, just another um, added value kind of coolness factor when an album has an obi strip. Mispressing. There's lots of different types of mispressings. Um, sometimes I'll see someone post a picture of an album and the disc label, instead of being right in the center, is actually off center and interrupts the grooves and completely destroys the music, right? And people are like, is this really valuable? This looks like an error. Well, no, typically it's trash because the music is ruined. Most people actually want to play their records. And so if you've got a disc label that's over here, that would be considered a mispress because it was um, when it was being pressed at the pressing plant, something was missed, there was an error and it was screwed up. So. Um, there's lots of different types of mispressings. Sometimes it has to do with, uh, there's a spelling error on the disc label and that will be considered a mispressing. By and large, most of them are not super valuable. They are a bit unique and some collectors do appreciate the, uh, the novelty of them though. All right, last but not least, let's talk through a couple different brand names because if you're getting into this hobby, you might see terms thrown around like VMP or MoFi or uh, move LP. So mobile fidelity or MoFi is an audiophile brand. That's, uh, one of the most common terms you'll see, uh, as far as an acronym is concerned, analog productions or AP is another very high end, uh, super high respect, a lot of respect for analog productions and the quality of the product they put out. I mentioned VMP. This is a, a vinyl me please pressing a uh, vinyl me please is a, uh, a record club where you can subscribe and receive a record a month. Um, uh, all unique pressings, most of them on colored vinyl, that type of thing. Move LP or music on vital vinyl M O V LP. That's a, uh, another, um, another reissue record label similar to mobile fidelity or maybe analog productions Mo music on vinyl, uh, um, produced only in Europe, I believe. So all those are imported to the United States and they are typically known for being pretty high quality as far as not only the, the quality of the record, but the packaging, not, not as uh, audiophile grade, if you will, as mobile fidelity, a lot of analog productions, uh, but certainly higher quality than a normal pressing. And then there's labels like Blue Note, which is a super famous jazz, um, jazz and album from, you know, dating back to the late fifties. Um, there's tons more labels you can get into Columbia, Sony. I didn't mention a lot of the, the normal labels. Those are some of the ones you see that are more abbreviated and acronyms, right? So most times when people talk about blue note, they're talking about the heyday of fifties, sixties jazz, but they're still active to this day. Uh, blue note is, uh, as far as being a very highly respected record label. So 
there you go. That's a lot of terminology. It is hard to consume all this. I've been collecting for 30 years and still learning new stuff. If you're just starting out, it's going to take time. Just pick it up in bits and pieces along the way. Um, gravitate towards what's most important to you. Like, what do you care about? That's probably my best advice if you're a new collector getting into this and trying to learn how to navigate this world of all these terms and um, unique uh, variations, not only in records themselves, but in the way they are pressed, the way they are talked about, right? So it is an entire culture and some people would say even a lifestyle to understand all of this and to live with it and to curate a, collect correction, a collection, but it is absolutely a labor of love. So there you go. Let me know what I've missed. Surely there's some terms on here. If there's any um, any that you're still confused about, by all means, put in the comments um, and, and reach out to us anytime. I really appreciate you watching. My name is G.I. Sanders, and we'll be back again soon with another episode of Talking About Records. <laughs>